Hey Digital Church, so good to be with you again another weekend. We are in our Build, Grow, Connect series talking today hosting problems, how we play host to some of the things in our life that actually shouldn't be there and really just getting rid of them so that God can build, help us grow and connect with the things that he has for us. Hey, do us a favor, uh, keep subscribing to these messages, hit us up where you're listening to us from, share it with your friends. We are so excited to be building with you. Hey, if you're in Barcelona, we will be there soon as well. We're just so excited, so many things happening. Enjoy this message, keep connecting with us. We love you and so excited that you're here. Good to have you here. Hey, uh, I wanna take a moment to highlight something just quickly. Uh, anyone remember, uh, what was it last week? No, the week before last that we were displaced and homeless for a quick minute. Anyone remember that? If you don't remember it, we'll start praying for you. You should remember that. Um, basically, we uh, got notice on a Friday that we, at Friday in the afternoon, that we couldn't be in this building. And we had to look for a new building uh, for that weekend. We were in Logan Square Auditorium. And the crazy thing is though, that even though we found out Friday afternoon, we ended up uh, having our biggest morning service that we've had ever, right? So that's weird. You, don't, you know what I mean? Because like people didn't even know where we were and we had to tell you all and you all still showed up somehow. Like it's, it's not normal, okay? So I started thinking, I was like, why did that happen? And what I realized, it, it, it happened because of the very just kind of church and human norm, which is simply this. When you and I think that there is no need or there's nothing for us to be responsible for, we don't activate, right? This is what we do, okay? So typically in churches, if you're 85% full to 75% full, people, you just stop growing because people look around and like, man, we've made it. We don't need to bring anybody, we're full anyway. If you've got a really, if you build with excellence and you've got a worship team that's doing great, you stop serving. Why? Because you're like, they don't need anybody on the worship team. I'm not needed. This is why most people just sit inactive in church, right? And then if we're not going together, then we don't grow. How does this pertain to what I'm talking about? Simple. On that weekend, we had more people than we usually have because all of us felt the need to like tell people about our change. And because we all got active, more people came. Now, every single Christian wishes they were a better like bringer, right? We've got like, even though we have angst around the topic evangelism, because you think like your pastor's gonna ask you to like get in your office and preach, you know what I mean? And do something crazy. And then everybody's gonna have to come to church. And you're like, you know, like, no, that's not what I'm saying. Today through technology, the beauty is that we don't all have to be together to like connect with each other. So through social media, when simple things happen, like what happened on that week and where more of you were like concerned that people didn't know where we were, that you posted about our church and because you posted, people showed up, right? And so what we do in Slack, Lauren was talking about it a bit through Renee. Um, oh, there's my name. That's me, guys. Uh, right there, we've got a whole bunch of channels, okay? Can we turn these lights? They're just like, right there. Retinas are just finished, fizzled out. I need new retinas. We're gonna have to have a prayer meeting after this. So actually, if I needed it through Slack, there's a prayer channel. I could ask, hey guys, my retinas are still burning from Sunday. Could you help me? And all of you will be like, oh, I'm gonna pray for my pastor with his retinas. He just came off the back of a bad cough. Let me pray for his retinas. You would just pray and it would all happen. There's channels like, man, you just wanna know what's going on. All that stuff is happening. But the one I wanna highlight is this one, digital promotion. You just go there, hit, did, right there, all that's happening. Bam, everything we put on our social media is at your fingertips. You don't need to be pushy. You don't need to be preachy. You could literally just let people know what's happening in your world. That is the beauty of social media. People get a window into what matters to you and then they kind of get inquisitive. It's a way of putting your life on display amongst countless people so that they might be in this place with you. Can I encourage you? If this is to be a church and I'm be, to be your pastor, we need to do what we could do together. And the greatest thing that you and I could do is just keep putting it out there. Is that cool? On Slack, digital promotions, you could do it. It's amazing. It'll change your world. Audrey, you're the most beautiful woman on the face of the planet. Every other woman, I'm sorry, and every other man, you've got you to aim for second best now. I'm sorry. It is what it is. If you're offended, I'm sorry. It's the truth and the truth hurts. My wife is the most beautiful woman on earth. That's my wife. I don't just say that to all of our worship leaders. You know what I mean? Although, Pete, I do think you're a beautiful man. And I feel like the people, wow, the drummer got excited about that. Okay, all right. 
You good? You happy? Even if you're not, God is going to do something, I believe, in this place. And it'll be good, man. So good to see you all. You're just also, you're the best looking church that I've ever seen. Not only that, you're the best looking service. That's right. That's right. And if you doubled up, God blesses it so you got better looking than you did in the first service. This is what happens. Man, if you want to find that in the Bible, it's in the Greek, hidden in the book of Chrysolothians. It's just there. Okay, well, anyway, thank you. Love you guys. You're awesome. Audrey, you're the awesomest in the world. Julio, you're so cool. I want to be you. Just tidy up those cables, mate. Tidy up those cables. <sighs> love church. Love what we do. Love what we're a part of. So, okay, um, we are in our series, Build, Grow, Connect. And uh, I'm really excited about today, and I'm excited to go through what, uh, you know, what God's got for us. And so before we get into it, though, I want you to focus on this message through the lens of growth. Okay, everyone say growth. Yeah. Say it like an Aussie. Growth. growth. Heaven smiles more, I think, in those moments. No, whatever. I'm patriotic. We did a USA chant last week, okay? I mean, what else can I do? Um... I want you to focus on this message through the lens of growth, okay? There's a reason for it. The number one weapon that you have against your circumstance, your hurts, your brokenness, your limiters, your barriers, the number one thing you have is the fact that you could grow bigger than them, right? You can grow bigger than what you go through. Now, what is growth? Growth in definition is the gradual journey towards maturity, okay? Every single one of us, there is like, there is a, there is a, a limiter to your growth, technically. Whatever your DNA says, whatever your growth, you know, plate says, like that's, that's what's left, that's what you're going to get to, okay? A tree has a limited amount of growth, like it's going to grow to whatever that is in the seed. It just is what it is. There is growth limiters. When you hit your limit, that's called full maturity, okay? Cool. So, here's the good thing though. As Christians, the Bible calls us a new creation. What is the goal for a Christian? The goal for a Christian is that we might grow to full spiritual maturity, right? That's what growth looks like. For us, a gradual journey towards looking like and acting like, speaking like Jesus, right? That's our goal. Here's the good thing. Jesus has no limits. So if Jesus is your new growth goal and He is what it looks like to be mature, then all of a sudden, where once you had limiters to your growth, now you have limitless potential to your growth. Which means that you and I can get bigger than our giants. You and I can get bigger than our circumstance. That is our greatest weapon and the devil knows it. This is why the devil is afraid of your growth. He will attack your growth. He will try to slow your growth. He will try to limit your growth. He will do whatever it takes because when there is potential for you to grow, there's potential for you to overthrow. Although there might be something in your life right now that holds the space and place of biggest controlling thing, God has something for you that is bigger than that. You are not limited by your past and you have a limitless future. This is the truth of having Jesus as our goal of a growth marker, okay? So where do we see this a little? We see the devil's, you know, plan and plot to stop what God wants to grow. And we see it all the way at the birth of Jesus. Throw over Matthew for me. Right here, you see it says, After the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother. The angel said, Stay there until I tell you to return, because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Herod was a, was a king, and like most kings, insecure. Why? Because there was a potential for Jesus, who was dubbed the child that was going to be a king, to overthrow Herod. He didn't understand what was going on, but still, he's there. And what's he trying to do? He tries to kill Jesus as an infant to stop his potential for growth. Because if he grows, he poses a threat of overthrowing. As you grow in your maturity, as you grow in your understanding, you pose threat to the things that are limiting you in your life. We often get so consumed with results that we forget that we just need the right formula for growth. Here's the thing. Growth is something God brings. We are responsible for the environment for it. Okay? This is what we're going to get into. We're going to go through it. I want to speak to you this morning from the subject, hosting problems. Hosting problems through the lens of growth. Is that good? You with me? 
You want to hear it? Come on, man. I need, I need, I need you to like, yeah, yeah. just lie to me. Lie to me if you have to. Here we go. If, if, okay, 1 Corinthians. Now, this is, this is a really cool moment because this is Paul, and he's having a pretty tough conversation with the church in Corinthians. Uh, he's basically having a conversation with them. He's like, hey, guys, like, I should be able to tell you some things, but you're not moving. And because you're not moving, I've got to talk to you the way I talk to anybody else because you just don't get it. We're not on the same page. You should be here, but you're stuck here. Growth will determine what you can handle. It's funny how when you were smaller, have you ever been, remember back in the day you used to think like your dad was like a giant? You know what I mean? My kids still ask me things like, can you lift up a train? I'm like, of course I can. I'm going to ride that momentum till they come to realization that dad cannot lift a train other than the one that they have. You know what I mean? Like that, that's it. But when you get bigger, you go, you go back to where you used to live and you always say this, it used to be bigger. Well, really the house stayed the same. You outgrew the environment you once were from. You will, you can, you should. You're called to outgrow the environments that you're currently in. It is your calling. It is your destiny. It is what God has for you. Let's read this quickly. It says this, Dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. I had to talk as though you belonged to the world. See, here's the thing. God is limited with what He can get to you sometimes because of what you're ready to digest. God maybe wants to bring some really great truths to you, but you're not able to digest them. So he has to hold back. Because even though he loves you, he won't choke you with his truth. So for all those people preaching things to people that aren't ready to hear them, maybe you should chill. For anyone in our digital community, there's always a Christian struggle with, they need to know. They need to know what they're ready for. It's our journey. It's our job to bring them to help them get to maturity. It's their job to receive the journey to maturity. You can't force it. You've got to wait for people to walk it. I had to talk as though you belong to this world or as though you were infants in Christ. I had to feed you with milk, not with a solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger. And you still aren't ready for you are still controlled by your sinful nature. You are jealous of one another and quarrel with each other. Doesn't that prove you are controlled by your sinful nature? Aren't you living like people of the world when one of you says, I am a follower of Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, aren't you acting just like people of the world? After all, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? We, only, uh, we are only God's servants, as through whom you believed the good news. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted the seed in your hearts, and Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. Everyone say that with me. God made it grow. God makes it grow. But you and me, we are responsible for the environment. You and me have a role to play. Growth is just the byproduct. However, it is a supernatural byproduct that God brings. So you and me can get so growth conscious that we psych ourselves out, we get overwhelmed and we go nowhere. But the reality is if we do the byproducts, growth just happens. God brings growth if you and me can take care of the environment that we need to take care of. When I was in... uh, Well, actually, it's well before Bible college. I think an issue that I've always had has been that I'm a I'm a I'm a tell everybody kind of person. (laughs) That's why I'm doing this. I am a tell everybody kind of person. Like, if I've just had something as simple as even a cheeseburger from McDonald's, not that I would ever do that because this is a temple. (laughs) But let's just say, for argument's sake, and like they just did a new burger. I'm telling you about it on Sunday. I'm telling you about it on Monday. I'm telling you about it through my Insta story. I'm telling everybody. I'm telling people on the train. You have, you got it. You, I mean, the McDonald's right there. Like on North Avenue, you've just got it. Like I'm just, that's just what I do. Recently just got back into snowboarding. So everyone in my life knows about it. You have to. You might not like it, but I do. And because I do, you're going to know about it. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you pictures, I'm going to show you videos, I'm going to see, I'm going to keep sending you videos. I'm going to send you links to videos. I'm going to, imbe- I'm just, it's just what I'm going to do. I, I just, I get excited. It's my fault. It's my burden. I once decided to put on, just cook a whole lamb. I do that sometimes. It's very biblical. I'm pastor, shepherd, whatever. <laughs> and I was cooking a whole lamb and Audrey's like, babe, like, just don't. I, didn't, I knew what she meant when she said, just don't. So, and I was like, don't. She was like, don't. And I was like, don't. She's saying, don't tell the world. I'm saying, don't judge me. And she's like, 12 people, Chris. No more. I'm like, babe, there'll be 10. 
well, didn't realize how excited I was about cooking this lamb. And uh, somehow these people invited other people, I'm sure. Because when I showed up to the house uh, with the cooked lamb that was supposed to feed 10 people, there was 74. <laughs> Don't know exactly how those 74 people got there. I think Audrey got a little bit loose lips, sink ships. You know what I mean? I'm blaming Audrey. But the reality is the odds are on me. I'm a tell everybody kind of person. It's just, it's, it's, it's just what I do. I can't help it. And so in college, I had my first house with, with my friends. There was five of us. We signed the lease. Two guys slept over and they never left. And this was the beginning of a problem. And so like I, we'd come home and there'd always be people just crashed out on our floor, on our lounge. You didn't want to sit on that lounge. Just a lot of, just, you just, did, it, you lose an arm. You know what I mean? And I remember my friends would always look at me and they go, bro, who's this? And I'm like, they just, I'm sorry. I mentioned that we have a house now. I got excited. We could host people. You know, got to the point where one day we come through the doors, 10 p.m., and there's two dudes on their own blow-up mattresses on our floor. And everybody just looks at me like, Chris. And I'm like, it wasn't me. I'm like, did you do it? Man, we all asked the question. None, no one knew, first of all, who invited them. Bigger problem, no one even knew who they were. <laughs> but in true college fashion, we just all went to bed. <laughs> we just like, well, I don't know. We'll find out in the morning. Morning comes, they're just gone. Like we don't, I, I still don't. If you're out there, you're welcome. We don't even know. But like our house became like ridiculous, man. Like people are walking in for lunch breaks. Our house became a cafeteria. You know, like they're just taking stuff. I literally walk in one day and a guy's walking out with my shirt. I'm like, this is not, what, what is this? And the truth is that I felt like a victim. I was like, I just can't believe people treat us like this. Like this is our own house. And we open it up. We're being generous. But then I had a bit of a revelation is that the way I hosted things created an environment for certain things to exist. Yeah, that's so good. I created an environment where rules didn't matter because everyone come in, they're like, they're like, where do I sit? Bro, who cares? <laughs> You're God's children. Okay, everybody, just who cares? Like food, take what you want. Refrigerator rights. I created an environment through the way that I hosted. That meant certain things flourished. People had no respect for our house, for boundaries. I mean, it was just, it was just ridiculous. And the reality is this, that some of us have things growing that we wish would die because we're just really good hosts for those things in our life. Some of us, negativity doesn't stop. Why? Because we're just a real good host for negativity. Some of us just got mentalities, criticisms, things that happen in our world. And the reality is you're just hosting them. And if we're going to actually mitigate some of the things that are flourishing in our world, we've got to ask, am I hosting it? Like, am I a good host for offence? Am I a good host for being negative and judgmental? Am I a good host for transition? I never seem to have somewhere that I call home because you're always looking for a perfect home. But perfect is built, not found. Perfect is something you contribute towards, not something you inherit. We often are where we are because we host an environment where these things can live. You've, we, if we're going to be who God called us to be, we've got to understand that there are things that God wants us to grow in. In fact, fruit of the Spirit is something He wants us to grow in. He wants us to shift. And if we are going to grow, we're going to look more like Jesus. And here's the thing. I often have people come to church and they're like, man, I love church. I love God. I love worship. But like, I'm not sure about this Jesus thing. I'm like, How's, I don't get it. And the reality is people who don't know Jesus often like to tell people about Jesus. You ever notice that? You ever had someone that doesn't know someone or something tell you about something? I was in a coffee shop once and this guy's talking about how he was in Australia. I was like, that sounds nothing like Australia. He even tried to say that he knew what city I was from because of my accent. I was like, okay. So tell me a little bit more about Australia. Oh man, <laughs> Can I just tell you, the weather there is chilly. Okay. I had another guy say, I go, I'm from Australia. He goes, I know where it is. My mom, uh, my mom was from Australia. My, my stepmother was from Australia. I'm like, oh, really? Whereabouts? He goes, New Zealand. 
I've never been to that part of Australia myself because uh, you can't drive there. It's another nation. Um, people can't tell you how to get somewhere they've never been before. And because we don't know who Jesus is, there becomes this problem that we start acting and telling and professing, but because we don't know who He is, we don't act like a grace-filled Saviour that He is. We don't act like a loving, generous Saviour that He is. We don't act like an inclusive Saviour that He is. We don't do that. Why? Because our, our, our markers for maturity are often off. You and I have to know God has set a new marker for you. Your new level of growth is not determined by your family history. It is not determined by your desires. It is determined by your new creation and you are created in the image of God and His Saviour who is Jesus. He is my growth limiter. I am not held back by what society tells me, by what my experience tells me. I am going to be just like my Saviour. I am going to reach my growth marker. I'm gonna become more generous. I'm gonna become more grace-filled. I'm gonna become more loving. I'm gonna become more understanding. I'm gonna become more patient. It might not be my personality, because I'm not, but my personality doesn't drive anymore. My Saviour does. My past doesn't drive anymore. My God does. My society doesn't dictate anymore. My God does. When He is my marker, things start to shift. And if things shift, I can outgrow the things in my life that are stopping me. You and I must be encouraged by the fact that we can outgrow the things that are in our world right now. If you've got a giant, if you've got a challenge, if you've got a mentality, if you're stuck somewhere, growth is your greatest weapon to stagnant. So here are three things. If we're gonna build, if we're gonna grow, if we're gonna connect, if we're gonna be able to get to the things that Corinthians is talking about, Paul telling the Corinthians church, if we're gonna get to be people, who can really digest the things that God has for us, then we've got to create an environment where we could grow. You ready? Build, grow, connect. These three things. Are you ready? Number one, if you're going to build, you've got to commit to laying down. Every building needs a foundation. Every building needs something to stand on. And here's the thing. That our life of building comes from our life and ability as Christians to lay down. Jesus established kingdom on earth by laying down His life. You and I, when I lay down my plans, God can build His purpose on top of it. When I lay down my time and expectations, I start to actually allow God to build peace. Because my angst only comes out of my timelines. If God, you don't show up here, if this doesn't happen, it probably never will happen which is a lie, not true, because the Bible says that God's plan does not delay, which is contradictory to experience because we often feel like God is late according to your schedule. But on God's timing, He doesn't delay. He gets it just when He planned, just when He needs to. If you and me can live a life of sacrifice, laying things down, God will build on them. Foundations are costly. Foundations take time. Foundations are hard work. Foundations often have to break things in order to lay things. You've got to break ground in some areas in your life in order to lay some things down. And the question is this, what you lay down will determine what God can build on. We often love arriving at people's point of success and we miss their point of sacrifice. And so we think that success is overnight. We think that it's easy. We think that growth is overnight and it's easy. Well, the reality is this. No one bucks the trend of biblical process. At the end of the day, God's not gonna build things on shaky ground. I'm not saying you and I need to be perfect, but it is visible all throughout the Word of God and in life that as you lay things down, God could build on them. I want to be the kind of person, less of me, more of God. So I've got to lay me down. How good are you at laying down before God's plan? Laying down before God's timing. What is that God is wanting to build in your life that is lacking sacrifice and foundation? You've got to lay something down so that God can build on it. If you're going to build a good marriage, you've got to lay down self. 
Because one of the biggest problems in marriage is we expect, 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 expect. I expect you to build. I expect you to give. I expect you to give me. I expect you to just, I expect you to do for me. I expect you to understand me. Instead of saying, man, let me lay that down so that God could build in me a heart to understand you, to meet your expectations, to love on you. And if the Bible tells us to love our wives and sets a precedence for love to be like Christ, well, here's the thing. God's love is unconditional. Meaning, you and me, we love with conditions. I will love you, but if I love you, you must love me back. If I love you, you must love me the way I want to be loved. If I give this love, I respect love in return, whereas God just gives love irrespective. Can you lay down what you want most? so that God can build what He needs to build in your world. Can you lay down what you've built? Can you lay down what you want most? Can you lay down your expectations? As we lay things down, God can build on them. Here's something that you need to lay down. Someone asked me, hey Chris, how do you get over the things that you go through? And I've often thought this, you need one, to deal with it. You need to process it. You need to heal with it. But before you can completely heal, you need a new experience. You'll never gain a new experience if you view it through the old. If you can lay down your old experience, you allow God to build a new one on it. Oh, Chris, that just sounds like motivational, but not super biblical. Let me tell you this. Every moment in the Bible, somebody had to stop living by previous experience and expect something new from God. The woman with the issue of bleeding for 12 years had to lay down her previous track record and be able to go to God with some sort of expectation. And here's the thing, when you lay that down, all of a sudden God, like, Faith builds and God can do something on that faith. There is something about laying things down so that God can build on them. Number two, growth. In essence, you and me, we want harvest, right? We want something. No, no one? I was like, man, can I just say the first service is so unholy. They're all about, we want, we want. You guys are like, no. We've taken point number one and we've laid everything down. Come on now. I didn't see anybody working for free. If you are, good on you. Uh, or not, you need to live. So, like, we want something. You have dreams, you have desires. In fact, most of us said yes to Jesus because we want something. We want healing, we want breakthrough, we want a better life. It's just what we do. And we want a harvest, and we think about harvest. And here's the thing if we don't understand that harvest is part of a cycle, we enjoy a harvest but it's the last harvest we enjoy. How so? Well, in the Bible, in Bible times, this is what would happen. They were taught that when they got their harvest, they wouldn't just be like, sick. You know what I mean? Some of us live paycheck to paycheck because we have no margin to create something different. And so we spend until we get. And in the Bible, what they would do is this part, He's going to feed my family. This part we will spend. This part goes to God. This part is for just like actual giving towards my community and helping. There was a difference. This part is for sowing. See, the thing is, if we don't understand the reciprocal cyclical nature of growth, we don't invest into it. But remember, God brings the growth, but you and I, are responsible for the elements of growth. So if we're not sowing seed and watering and taking care of the seed, but yet expecting harvest, all of a sudden it stops. How does this even work in my life? It works in your marriage. It works in your job. It works in your relationships. It works when you come to a church because often we're all get, get, get without any give. The Bible says this in Proverbs, that a man of many friends must himself be friendly. We want good friendships. But do we ever stop to ask the question, am I a good friend? We want great churches, but we never ask, am I a great church builder? We want servant hearts, but we don't ask if my heart is ready to serve. We want grace, but we don't ask, how much of it have I given? We want energy, but we don't ask, how much of it have we sown? Some of us think we're going to get more energy because we rested more. I don't know any athlete that gets ready for a competition through sleep. Call your friend. What's up, bro? What are you doing? 
Ugh, just, man, just woke up. What, what are you doing? Just training. Oh, what for? Trying to get to the Olympics. Really? Cool. What, 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 uh, what competition? Eight hour sleep? Like, what, what is it? Because I don't know what you're going for. You don't build capacity through, without investing into it. So what do you do to increase heart your, your lung capacity? You got to you got to go to increase the way that your bo- your body like makes sense of oxygen and utilizes it through the bloodstream. You've got to go. You've got to invest. You got to do. If you're gonna grow, you've got to give. Something in your life needs sowing. And I'm not just talking about the typical like fears of like oh he just wants us to give in church. You need to make giving something you do. When was the last time you measured your giving in your marriage? And is it actually in proportion to the years married? I met someone once and they were just talking through a massive marriage breakup and look, not, not their fault, but something to learn from. And one of their statements as they reminisced on what they've learned, they said they read the situation wrong. They thought that their partner was just understanding and that they didn't fight because it was just everything was good. In retrospect, what they realized was that their communication and their sowing and their giving to each other didn't grow in proportion to the years married. So all of a sudden, from one day to the next, it's over. And we often go, man, there was just no signs. There's always a sign. What you don't water, God can't grow. You ever got growth wrong? How often do we just want God to grow things? God, why aren't you growing my church? God, why aren't you growing my marriage? God, why aren't you growing my finances? Yet God is waiting for us to water and sow so that He could grow. But we don't want to water things. We just want God to do it. We just want God to show up. God, God is not always going to fix what you need to grow, what you need to sow, what you need to water. Can I encourage you? Is your current giving in your life at the proportion of where your life is at? Are you giving with your friends? Are you giving with the people around you? If you give what you sow into, it will grow. Growth is a byproduct of what you sow and how you water. Number three is this. Build, grow, connect. How do you connect with people, God, and your future? Number one, the simple one for this is reach. You must reach. But here's the thing. You never reach for things you don't think you can obtain. Do you often, like we often just don't go for things because God wouldn't give them to us. We don't go for things because they're not an option for me. They're not an option for where I come from. We often don't reach because we have expectations for people to reach out to us. You ever felt and gone through a season alone because people should have known? You ever pulled away because nobody pushed in? Yet no one's a mind reader on this earth. No one knows what you need but you. Reach. If you want to hear God, reach. You want to see God move in your life, reach. Reach for something. Give Him space to fill. Let Him do something in your world. This is not complicated. It is not difficult. Some of us are where we are because we stopped reaching. I was waiting for God to do something. I prayed. I pushed. I asked. And He just didn't show up. No matter how hard I looked, God was nowhere to be found. Or maybe in times what I've learned, I've learned I can actually do nothing by myself. There's this, what I think is stupid. If you've posted it, just have grace for me. And I think ignorant and arrogant, like little motivational meme, whatever that goes around the internet and it says that something like the storms whispered to me, you are something, and I whispered back to the storm, I am the storm. (laughs) It sounds good, right? The storm said, I'm going to take you out. And I said, this is storm. I'm taking you out. Oh, I see what you did there. Oh, the warrior. Yeah, there's the warrior said to the storm. Okay, if you've been in a storm, you're not whispering anything other than mum or Jesus. 
my, 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 Jesus, Jesus. Like, that's what you're whispering, okay? And if you've grown up in the ocean, not in it, because you'd be a mermaid, that'd be insane. If you've grown up around the ocean, okay, you know the power of the ocean. Like, you could be on a three foot wave and it's gonna do what it wants with you. If you're in a real ocean, once you're past hips deep, it's doing what it wants with you. A riptide isn't even visible and it's taking you where it wants to. And if you've been in an ocean when there's a storm, don't come to me and tell me you're a warrior. You're not. One of the greatest things you could do for your humanity is realize your humanity. You're frail, you're unable, you don't have the strength. And even the strength that you have thought that, oh man, I was just strong enough to get through it. I don't know how I got through it. Yeah, you don't know, but let me tell you, okay? Because Jesus loves you so much that He's involved in your world even before you know it. Because the same principle, a great principle in life is if, if it's good enough for God, good enough for me. Well, tell me, let me tell you what God does. Before we even loved Him, the Bible says, whilst we were enemies with Him, whilst we hated Him, He did one simple thing, He reached. God, I don't even see you anywhere around me. It's because He's carrying you. You think you made it because you're strong? You think you're whispering to the storm? Now you're in the hands of the one who holds the storm. God has got you. God has increased your capacity. God has increased your strength. God has given you what you need to get through. You and me, we gotta know this. We get through what we get through, even in moments where it doesn't seem like He's around because He gets you through it. He is a God that isn't just loving. He exemplifies, He embodies. He is the true meaning of love. He loves you even though you hate Him. He loves you when you disagree with Him. He loves you when you do wrong. He loves you when you do right. He loves you in your worst day. He loves you in your best day. His love doesn't change even though your heart does. You wanna connect with Him? Just start reaching. You and me have to learn how to keep reaching to the God who first reached out to us. Reach for the things He's spoken in your life. Reach for His promises. Reach for His presence. Reach for His Word. Reach in prayer. I'll finish with this. Every good host starts by making an invitation. And a real eager host doesn't even have an invitation yet. They just know, want you to know that they're gonna send one. They give you like a save the date. You don't even know what you're going, but they just save it. Save it, this day's gonna be epic. I am gonna put on, like you just wait. You need an invitation. Every host needs an invitation. One of the greatest things that you and I could do is invite God into our circumstance. You don't need to fully know Him. You don't need to understand Him completely. That is a journey. But can you invite the Saviour and the Creator of the universe into your world? Can you invite Him into your worst day? Because He sees it anyway. Can you invite Him into your problems? If you invite God in, you now partner with the person, with the God that can shift it. You don't need to do this alone. If you're gonna grow, if, if you're gonna build, grow and connect with the things that God has for you in this world and your life, you've gotta learn to reach. Lay down, give and reach. And God will continue to build, grow and connect you with the things that He has made you for. Amen. If you believe it, one of you, you've gotta shout a praise in this place. So I hope that spoke to you. I hope that message helps you apply how to build, how to grow, and what to connect with during the week. Some exciting stuff coming up in the life of the church. No matter where you are, you could be a part of it. You might even be able to make your way out here. Tried and True Conference coming up. It's our relationship conference. We've got Pastors John and Helen Burns with us. It is so powerful. Hope you could be a part of it. We've also got Barcelona on the way and we've got our new building. If this is home for you and this is something you get to connect with, we appreciate your giving. You could go to our website, scroll down and choose what you wanna to give towards. Thank you again. Keep tagging us, keep sharing this with your friends. We wanna keep building with you. We love you, have a great week.